video will talk about Pseudomonas originosa. So this is a high yield video for USMLE step one. Stay tuned till the end. So in this video, we would talk about the microbiology, pathology, identification of Pseudomonas and ultimately the treatment. So this is the overall video outline. So Pseudomonas originosa is a gram negative bacteria which is abundant in the environment. It's an opportunistic pathogen and can infect high risk individual. So imagine a person who is in a ventilator or imagine a person who is uh, immunocompromised. They are at higher risk of infection with Pseudomonas originosa. And the important fact that we need to understand that Pseudomonas originosa is getting increasingly resistant to multi-drug and that is why from a clinical point of view it is very difficult to treat and this is also the most uh, uh, commonly acquired um, hospital, ac hospital or ICU acquired infection. So Pseudomonas originosa let us talk about some morphological features it is a gram negative rod it is encapsulated and motile it contains polar flagella that you can see already in this diagram and it's an obligate aerobe. So let's talk about some identifiable features. It is catalase positive, citrate positive and oxidase positive. It can also form spore but does not ferment lactose. So in McConkie agar they would uh, give rise to these yellowish colonies which are typical to lactose non-fermenters. It has pili which helps them to attach or adhere to the target cell surface and flagella which help them to wade through the thick mucus tissue, um, thick, thick mucus layer and reach the target cells. Also on its surface it has multi drug resistance transporter which can pump out many of the antibiotics and making it very difficult bacterial strain to treat. Pseudomonas originosa are widely found in medical devi devices such as ventilators, urinary catheters, etc. Sometimes they can also form biofilm which is even more dangerous because many of these implants on which if Pseudomonas originosa, or originosa forms a biofilm it would be quite difficult to treat. Now basically it is associated with pneumonia, implant associated infection, catheter infection, urinary tract infection, etc. So it could be localized or systemic as well. So in terms of localized infection, one of the most common one is external otitis. That means ear infection basically, which happens uh, in case of swimmers. So it's no, also known as swimmers ears because it is commonly found in water or soil. Also, people who are uh, especially diabetic and elderly, they might develop necrotic otitis. Also, it can lead to cerebral abscess or meningitis. When it comes to lung, it can grow nicely because lung is a place where you have air. And it can ha inject several cytotoxins such as XOU, XOT, etc. We'll come to that. But anyway, it grows very nicely in our airway epithelium. Basically, there are specific macrophages which try to engulf the pathogen. And basically, there are toll-like receptor signaling that can recognize the pathogen. The lipopolysaccharide on the membrane would eventually be recognized by the toll-like receptor 4 or TLR4. And that lead to an inflammatory cytokine release. Eventually, it would attract more and more immune cells like neutrophil, dendritic cell into the location and let them to release again inflammatory cytokine. Overall, there is a huge lung infl inflammation that can occur with the inf infection of Pseudomonas originosa. Now, Pseudomonas originosa secrete all of these uh, exotoxins, which are exo-U, exo-T, exo-S, exo-Y. All of these can kind of prevent phagocytosis and that uh, give them more survival chance inside a host body. Now let's talk about all the factors that can contribute to virulence. So obviously pili and fimbri are the things that can basically help them to attach to cell surface and basically navigate their way through mucus layers. Cytotoxins as we talked about like exo-U, exo-T, all of these can be injected using the type 3 secretion system. And there is also uh, <coughs> siderophores which are iron chelating agents which give them some survival advantage. There are different toxins 
which could be uh, useful for these bacteria and could be damaging for the host. So there are phospholipase, there are uh, basically several pigment type of toxins, there are several extracellular toxins which are uh, quite detrimental for the host. Lipopolysaccharide is the key inflammatory mediator and it's kind of generic for most of the gram negative bacteria but it gives rise to the inflammatory response via TLR4. Now there are different proteases like elastase A, elastase B, large protease, protease 4 etc that is secreted by this bacteria which can be damaging to the host cells or even the immune cells. When it comes to laboratory diagnosis they can be uh, one can suspect that it's a Pseudomonas originosa using gram stain, but it's never a deterministic test. So obviously other tests such as catalase positive, citrate positive or oxidase positive along with gram negative bacteria would make the scenario a little bit more clear. But eventually they has to be isolated in either non-selective media, for example, blood agar, where they would show a beta, beta hemolysis pattern. And also they can be basically recognized in the McConkey agar, where they would uh, act like a typical lactose non-fermenter colony that that means yellowish so this is how one can basically um, recognize these pathogens when it comes to treatment obviously these are bacteria so antibiotics would be the treatment regime but combinatorial antibiotics is important for example cephalosporins aminoglycosides and basically fluoroquinolones are used in combination to treat Pseudomonas originosa. But increasingly, they are acquiring multi-drug resistance. So that is why this is going to be a kind of like big headache for the doctors in near future. So I hope this video was useful. If you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. See you in the next video.